Hi, welcome back to Codex. Our speaker today is Margaret Cheney, who is the Yates Chair and Professor of Mathematics at Colorado State University. Professor Cheney is well known for her substantial contributions to inverse problems in acoustics and electric magnetic theory. Today, she will talk about tuning to target resonances. Take it away, Margaret. Well, thank you, and thank you for the invitation to speak. So I should probably say at the beginning, this is this is really about rate problems in radar and sonar. I guess that's not obvious from the talk from the title. But, um, so, um, so this is mostly about how do we find target resonances. So um, one answer. So maybe what is a resonance first? So a resonance is a peak in the energy that is scattered. The way I'm going to define it. And so why would you be interested in that? Well, one reason is. If you're trying to detect a very weak target using radar, then you would like to be able to be transmitting the, the wave that will scatter the most. So you get the most energy scattering back. And so, so that will maximize potentially target detection. And then um, there's there's been some a lot of interest in this um, in this general idea. Uh, as a possible aid to classifying targets. And the reason for that is that um, I'll talk a little bit about, um, it turns out these resonances correspond to poles of the scattering operator. And I'll say more about that uh, later also. So the, the scattering operator turns out to be analytic in uh, one of the half planes, depending on which sign you choose. And the, the poles, um, are characteristic of the object that's doing the scattering. And the reason that's very interesting is the, 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 those poles are independent of the angle from which you're viewing the target. And so that's very interesting. You know, if you, if you look at airplanes from different points of view it, using optical images, they all look different, right? And it would be hard to teach a computer how to do that. But if you were able to, identify poles from the radar backscattering, those might be able to tell you uh, very well what, what kind of target it was. And then th there's a potential connection with, um, suppose you want to deposit a lot of energy on that target. You know, with, like for example, people are interested in doing this in medical applications, for example, they want to burn, burn up tumors, for example, or, uh, or zap um, kidney stones. So, so there are other reasons for being interested in this problem. Oh, and I wanted to mention also that this discussion about poles, some of you may have actually worked on a problem like this because the, the identifying the poles is essentially the same as uh, identifying decaying and a, a sum of decaying and oscillating exponentials. So in particular, if you have some waveform that, that depends on frequency, you know, you're maybe measuring in the time domain, if you, do uh, uh, apply the Cauchy integral theorem, the residue calculus to this Fourier transform, you end up with a sum of residues. And what do those look like? Well, that looks like the sum of exponentials. And because these uh, complex coefficients here are complex, these are oscillating and decaying exponentials. So some people have approached the problem from this point of view. Okay, so the way I'm gonna talk about this is to let, let's think about the problem of detecting, of, of getting the, doing the best detection. In other words, what space-time waveform should we transmit towards a target that will scatter the most energy back? So one the the way I formulated this in this particular paper down here is you know, suppose we divide the the all of space um, we, we uh, put a separating hyperplane, a uh, separating plane somewhere. And we'll say on one side of the plane, we can create any kind of wave, wave we want, any kind of field we want. We have complete control in that half space. And then in the other half space, there's a mysterious target and we'd like to find out what that is. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create any kind of, of field up in the accessible half space and that field will propagate down, we'll want to be, create waves that are propagating down. And then those waves will scatter off this target and propagate back up. And that map from the downgoing wave to the upgoing wave is the scattering operator. And so how would we maximize this? We want to find what is the downgoing wave 
that gives us the most upgoing energy. And so the way you would do that would be you'd try to maximize, here's, your, here's the upgoing energy due to that target. And whenever you're doing this kind of thing, you always have to, to um, normalize by say the energy of the incident wave, because otherwise the answer you get is always, oh, you should put, you should input all the energy in the universe, <laughs> right? And, and that's not realistic. So you always have to divide by say the energy of the, of the, the wave you're putting in. And so when we write this out using inner products and then move one of the scattering operators over on the other side with its adjoint, I'm using, here I'm using a, a dag, this is the physics notation using a dagger for the adjoint. We, um, we end up with this expression, which all, probably all you mathematicians will recognize as a Rayleigh quotient, right? So, so if, this, um, if this operator here were a matrix, we would know exactly what to do. We, um, the, the answer is the maximum is the, eigen, the largest eigenvalue and the wave that gives us the best uh, scattered, the, the e, e down, the, the, the input wave that gives us the most energy is the eigenvector corresponding to that largest eigenvalue. And we also know that um, like from numerical analysis that we actually have a, a procedure for calculating that best eigenvalue and eigenvector, and that's the power method. So in other words, if you just take this um, operator and you apply it over and over and over to anything, you could start with anything, then you get the, this, this quotient that <laughs> as you, as you th this process will, will converge to that, to the right answer. If you just apply the operator over and over again, normalize appropriately, then you, you end up with the eigenvalue and eigenvalue eigenvector that's best. And so it turns out in this um, problem, if you use the energy norm here, and you compute what this adjoint is, it turns out to be an operator that involves time reversal. So you, you reverse, you, so this says, first you do a scattering experiment, you, know, you send in a downgoing wave, you measure the upgoing wave, and then you take that upgoing wave and you reverse it in time. In other words, you send out the stuff that came in last, you send that out first, and you use that as the next waveform. You do another scattering experiment, and then you time reverse, and then you just keep doing that over and over again. So this actually gives you an experimental way of computing this maximum. So you don't even, yeah, so, so you can just come compute this. So why does this work? So it's easy to understand why you get, why, why this procedure gives you a lot of backscattering energy in the spatial way of thinking about, you know, the, we're interested in space-time waveforms. So the spatial part is pretty straightforward. If you think about this simple example, suppose you have an isolated point target scattering, scatterer, and you just send in anything. Well, that, that um, point scatter will scatter as an outgoing spherical wave. And then if you take that outgoing spherical wave and you time reverse it, what you get is an incoming focusing spherical wave that's focusing right on the, on the target, right? And, and clearly that's gonna give you more energy than what you started out with. So that's the spatial part. Now, what about the temporal part? The temporal part is a little more complicated because that's a continuous, you know, we have a continuum, continuous spectrum and so forth. So, um, but the, the right way to think about it is to, Fourier transform into the frequency domain. And so if everything is stationary, then the, at each, then you can, then, then pretend that this was a matrix that you had. That you would have a matrix that depends on frequency and all the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, everything depends on frequency. And so if you plotted all the eigenvalues as a function of frequency, you could, you know, you get the biggest eigenvalue and then these others is just kind of a notional diagram. So what would the answer to this problem be? The answer would be, well, you should look at whatever curve is, is highest on this plot. And that's this top one here. And the point where it is largest, that frequency, you should transmit that frequency and the spatial part that you should transmit, the spatial aspect should be the eigenvector corresponding to that eigenvalue. 
And you can, you can understand how this comes out of the power method if you think about what happens when you raise uh, some operator to a power. If you just imagine diagonalizing this matrix and then you raising it to a power, what happens is you just raise the, the diagonal, you just raise all the eigenvalues to a power. And now everything depends on frequency, right? So, so what happens when you raise something that has say a little, uh, a, mac, a local maximum, what happens when you raise something like that to a power? Well, you get the, the, the peak sharpens, right? So as you, as you take higher and higher powers, you get peaks that sharpen up and eventually they'll become delta functions if you go infinitely far. And so that peak will occur right at the, the largest value of, of, well, whichever eigenvalue you're, you're looking at. So you ch should choose the largest one. So th that's the way to think about it. This, this paper that uh, um, I referenced to is, is, was much more technical because it was dealing with continuous spectrum. But this is kind of the right way to think about it. This is the, the intuitive idea of what's going on. So, so this theory actually explains some experiments. I don't know if people in this audience have, uh, are familiar with the work of Matthias Fink in Paris. Um, so he did some experiments involving exactly this sort of time reversal um, process. So I, I just pulled this uh, figure off of one of the slides that I found on the, on the internet. <laughs> this is from one of his talks. Um, so he's, he did these experiments in a water tank and he's got an array of transducers here that I guess 128 of them. And then he puts various things in the tank and he does this exactly this time reversal process. So each transducer transmits something and then he receives that. And then this, these transducers are connected to a computer which then does the time reversal and then sends back out the time reversed version of the waves to retransmit. And then he does another experiment and so forth. And um, I, I actually visited there a long time ago and asked uh, his collaborator, Claire Prada, um, uh, do you see these, uh, con this convergence to a single frequency wave? You know, th that's what my theory is predicting. And she said, well, actually they, and it, they, they had worked out the theory for spatial focusing, but they hadn't really thought about the temporal aspect. But Claire said, yes, we see pulse lengthening and frequency shifts. And so here's a, a diagram from one of their papers that, um, that shows, so here's the, the array of transducers and they had some, um, some complicated stuff that they had to go through. And then they had wires that they were scattering off of and their initial uh, response, here's the plot of the initial response. They have a strong wire and a weak wire or a strong scatter and a weak scatter. And then after a few iterations, they see this, um, this, they get this plot. And so you can see clearly that the pulses have lengthened and there may be a frequency shift, it's a little hard to tell. And then the, the Chinese have also picked up this idea. They're interested in uh, trying to identify objects on the, the seafloor, uh, probably mines or something. And they're using actually a single uh, transducer and transmitting a wave that comes down and scatters off. And um, there they are proposing uh, detecting resonant targets on the basis of this iterative time reversal process. So in other words, they transmit one wave and then they iterate, they time reverse iterate. And if the, the, uh, the, this process converges to a single peak, they are gonna declare that there is a target with a resonance down there. So um, uh, some years ago, my, one of my uh, former students, Jerry Kim, who's a very unusual student, um, uh, very capable, um, we decided to look at uh, a, a very simple example of this and try to understand explicitly what's going on. So we looked at the case of, we have just two sensors and then we have a very simple target, but this is, is chosen so that it exhibits this kind of resonance phenomenon. So here we're gonna, we're gonna change the definition of the scattering operator. Instead of mapping from up, up going, down going and up going waves, we're gonna say that we transmit the field at uh, sensor one and sensor two. So these are our time domain uh, waveforms. And then 
we that they map to the field received at that at sensor one and sensor two, and the map that does that uh, transformation is what we'll call the scattering operator for this for this uh, process. And we're we're gonna let's see. Actually, I'm a little I'm going a little slower. I think I'm going to skip this this model. I, um, it, it turns out when you have these ide two ideal point scatterers, uh, you can work out very explicitly and easily what the scattering is from them, uh, just using this uh, multiple scattering theory that's uh, very kind of intuitive. I was going to go through this, but I think I'm, I'm going a little slower than I expected. So I think I'm going to skip this and just point out that uh, this, this just reduces to solving a little system of two equations and two unknowns. And you get a very explicit formula here. You have um, some uh, stuff in the denominator and the zeros of, this, of these denominators these frequencies where the denominator is zero give you the resonances. So uh, he, Jerry did some experiments and found that if we uh, took a, this analytical model of this target, we could work out exactly what the eigenvalues were as a function of frequency. Here's the largest eigenvalue, here's the smaller eigenvalue. And you could transmit a broadband waveform, like for example, a chirp. So a chirp is a linearly increasing uh, a, a signal, a oscillating, uh, oscillating signal, linear frequency modulated signal. And this is kind of a cartoon of it. In practice, this chirp was oscillating so fast that when you plot it, it just everything just looks black, but that's really what's going on there. And the, the, the frequency, the, the Fourier transform of this chirp looks like this. So th there's the spectrum. And so when we do explicitly some uh, of these iterative time reversal processes, uh, we end up with, so here he, he's, he plotted on transmitter one and transmitter two, what waveform we got after the two iterations. And this was the, the Fourier transform, the spectrum. So here in the dark curves, that's the largest eigenvalue that, we're, that we believe is controlling the process. And the, the light dotted line was the original waveform. That was the, the spectrum of the chirp. And after two iterations, this heavy black line is the, the spectrum of this, this waveform. So you see it's converging to the uh, eigenvalues of the, the, the it's, it's converging to, a, to peaks at eigenvalues, uh, at, the, at the maxima of the eigenvalues. And after 10 iterations, you, the peaks are narrower. And then he also figured out what to do about what happens with, you know, when you have moving targets. So, so this is actually um, kind of interesting because all the theory that has, was developed before was assuming the target was stationary. But if your target's actually moving, you know, you could start out doing an iterative time reversal process, get the, your sensors to be focusing on this target. And then if the target moves, well, for example, if it started out here and moved over here, it's moving into a null of the, of the beam pattern from this, of, the, of these two sensors. And so pretty soon you're gonna get no signal back. And so that's, that's clearly not the right answer. Okay, so, so uh, here we're, we'll use this notation, capital T is the, wave, the transmitted waveform, S again is the scattering operator, and R is the, is the received waveform. So uh, I think maybe I won't go through a lot of this in detail, but, but if the waveform that you get will be time delayed according to how far away the object is from the sensors, and then it'll also be Doppler shifted or Doppler, there's actually a Doppler scale factor that's a, it's a, it's a time dilation. Um, so you end up with a, a, a signal model from a moving target involving this Doppler shift. And uh, when you Fourier transform this, it turns out you get expressions that involve the change due to motion. And you can identify, this allows you to factor the scattering operator in terms of the, the, the scattering operator at the original position multiplied by a Doppler operator, which, which has these, um, the, the, the information about the motion along the diagonal. So this allows you to make a modified iterative time reversal process. So these blue things are supposed to be antennas and we're, we transmit a wave through these antennas, it scatters off our target and then we, it re returns back. And then we would have to extract the Doppler shifts, figure out, you know, analyze the transmitted signal and the received signal and compare those to get the Doppler shifts. 
then construct this Doppler operator, and then multiply our received wave, our received signal by this Doppler operator. And then we would time reverse, normalize, and do it again. And then when you do that, you end up with uh, the, the uh, waveform that you get. That, so the, uh, this is, <laughs> yeah, the, so the waveform that you get after doing this for n times, you end up with, um, you find that the, the um, scattering operator, this S star S, is again being raised to the nth power. So that's the thing that's causing the enhancement of these resonances, is causing the waveform to focus in, in spectrum, not in time. It focuses spectrally on the resonances. So, so uh, and then here's a plot that shows if you do this Doppler correction, you get more signal. If you don't do the Doppler correction, you, the, the target can go through these nulls. The, the, this uh, plot up here, suppose our, our target starts out here and the time reversal process focuses on that target. And then if it moves, then this process will follow the target so that the target is still in the peak of the, of the uh, sensor array. So it's, uh, this is sort of interesting that um, it, it gives us sort of a way of doing tracking, but without any of the standard sort of common filtering. But, but this, is, this is doing tracking with lots of experiments. You know, you're, you're transmitting waves over and over again. Oops. Um, uh, it also, uh, we know that we get better detection performance because we'll get more signal and we'll get also spectral focusing to the resonances. So that work was uh, vulnerable to the criticism. Well, that was a very unrealistic model of the antenna and the target. So how do we know this really works? So, so we teamed up with my colleague, uh, Gerhard Christensen in Lund, Sweden. And to do, he, he's a, an electromagnetics expert. And, and uh, so he uh, helped with the modeling the antenna and, the, and gave us a more realistic model of the target. Um, so here we would uh, put in some energy into the antennas and then the antennas do themselves do something to it. And then it gets uh, transmitted and scatters and the scatterer does something complicated to it. And then after it goes through the antennas again, then we end up with a, a received signal beta. So we use this notation. So this is kind of the, the scattering operator that includes the antennas and the target and everything. And it turns out that you can uh, sort of decompose this into the, the piece that you actually measure. And then there's a part that is due to the antenna. So, you know, you would take your antenna into an indoor radar range and you would make lots of measurements on it. And so you would figure out how to characterize the antenna depending on, uh, you know, how does it behave as a function of frequency? How does it behave as a function of angle? And you would put those that information in here. And then there's a piece that corresponds to the actual target, which is what we're interested in. So um, in order to get information about the target, we have to remove all this stuff about the antenna and the, the, syst the measuring system. And this is actually a very uh, well-known uh, process among experimentalists. They, they know, they call it equalization, that you remove these system effects. So this gives us a, a, um, a, a modified version of a time reversal process. We would send in something, it would scatter, and then we have to correct for the antenna responses and then time reverse and then pre then normalize and then pre-distort for the antenna responses and then send a new, um, a new uh, waveform at the end. So I think what's more interesting to this audience, I think this audience isn't so interested in the antenna modeling, but, but what's sort of interesting is the, the connection between the, is, is the modeling of the target. So this is a very simple target. It's just a dielectric sphere made out of one material. And you can do a separation of variables calculation to figure out what the scattering operator is for that. So you get, and, and um, everything is a uh, vector because uh, elect, this has a full, here we're do, using the full electromagnetic field. So we have uh, two polarizations, but the, the key behavior as a function of frequency is given by this coefficient S sub B. And this is the thing you can calculate with separation of variables. You, uh, you, and it's written as a, as a sum, 
And each element, is, there are these two terms, T1 and T2, and they're, you know, they're, these L's correspond to the, the spherical harmonic um, expansion. So you end up with an explicit expression here, and you end up, you can characterize these poles by the zeros of the denominator again, and, and you have Bessel functions and Hankel functions and so forth. So the interesting thing though, is if you plot the magnitude of this SB, this is giving us the, the, uh, the frequency response of this dielectric sphere. You have this complicated expression that's involving the, uh, these Ts. And so you can figure out where exactly all the poles are and they're, they're, uh, they can be labeled by, is it a pole of T1 or T2? and which, which L which spherical harmonics coefficient do you have? And so we can plot everything in this, so everything's plotted here. So, so the, the solid line is the response on the frequency axis. So that's the magnitude of this, the, of this uh, mag yeah, magnitude of this. And then you can identify the poles uh, related to these different indices. And so, so those are labeled here as, you know, the one, one pole corresponds to T1, L equals one, and there's a, a, a pole right there. And so you notice a, a number of things here. Oh, and here's a plot of where the poles are. So for different L values and different T values. So you notice a number of things. First of all, it's really complicated, even for this very simple target. And then some of these spikes are extremely narrow. Like, look at this. This one five one, it just looks like a line. So, so if you're if you're trying to sample in frequency, you have to sample really finely to catch all these. And then another problem is some of these poles don't correspond to peaks at all. Like this this one one I mentioned, that's not at the right place for the peak. And and then some of the some of the peaks, the local maxima, don't seem to correspond to poles either. And so this is this is because the behavior in the complex plane is pretty complicated and you have the effects adding and so forth. So this is kind of uh, very discouraging for the, the, the proposal of trying to use these poles to identify targets. It's gonna be really hard. By the way, pe people were very interested in this about 20 or 30 years ago, this approach, and they found that in practice, they could actually only measure one or two poles and it was very noisy, it was very hard to do. So there's already indication that this process is very difficult. Maybe the iterative time reversal process can help with that by finding at least the real parts, but this, this is very, this is discouraging because it looks very hard. So then we did some experiments with uh, uh, time reversal iterations show that if, if you don't equalize, you, you pick out different poles or some, or you can get the wrong, wrong peaks and so forth. And then, um, if you have, you know, long antennas tend to transmit low, low frequency waves and short antennas tend to transmit high frequency. And so the, what waves your antenna is transmitting will depend on which, which of the peaks that you pull out here. Okay, so, so this uh, little study here is sort of showing that first of all, this equalization process is important. And then the structure of the poles and resonances is, is very complex, even for even for this simple sphere target. Um, and then if you want to sample, it's better not to sample in the frequency and domain, it's better to sample in the time domain and, and Fourier transfer. So then um, I started talking about this. So um, one of my colleagues who does sonar, this Ivars Kirstein says, is interested in potentially using these things, these resonance ideas to identify stuff underwater, sort of like what the Chinese were doing, that Chinese paper. I showed, and he's, he told me that the people at ONR um, are, are very tired of hearing about time reversal. Um, it, in fact, um, John Taig, who has, is now gone, uh, uh, actually had a, a comment on his page about what he was interested in at the bottom. He said, he's not interested in time reversal. <laughs> so so the, the reason is that, um, that they argue, well, all you're doing with this time reversal is just taking this transfer function. You know, the, the engineering community calls this, this uh, scattering operator, especially if it's a scale, it calls it a transfer function. You're just taking the transfer function and raising it to a power. 
So what's so special about that? You could just do that in the computer. Why do you need all this expensive equipment? So that's a good point. Why? But it seems as if maybe the time reversal would have some advantages in terms of noise. So isn't it, won't it be, make it easier to pull, pull out the signal out of noise? So we started doing some, uh, some experiments, some numerical experiments, simulations. And uh, we, so here is our, I think this is part of the dielectric sphere um, uh, transfer function scattering operator. And then if we add noise to it, uh, it can be so noisy that you can't even see anything. But then if you do averaging, you know, it's known that if you just measure something over and over and over again, if you do that a thousand times and you average, that beats down the noise. So here is an example of averaging stuff that looks like this a thousand times, a thousand samples. And hey, it looks kind of similar to this. So maybe we can just raise that to a power. So, um, so we did some experiments here, some numerical experiments. We, um, we looked at averaging. If you average uh, two, four, or seven times, this is what you get. And, and I guess we also raised it to a power. Um, and then if you compare that with doing two, four, or seven iterations of the time reversal process, we do get something much, much cleaner even after only seven iterations. So that sort of suggests maybe time reversal has some advantages. So here's an example of comparisons between averaging. So this was averaging from 10 up to 1,000 samples. And then um, uh, this is the, looking at the error in, so, so this is, suppose you, uh, you have, a, uh, let me just go back as I'm, so suppose you have a, a, a response like this and you just pick one number as to what you think the, ma the main resonance is. So in this case, it would be this, this value, which is uh, you know what 1.8 or 1.9. And down here, you would pick the value and that's two. Okay, so, so if you look at the, at the values that are predicted, you find that um, it, if you look as a function of noise, that the time reversal, which is the solid blue line, does behave much better. It goes down to a zero or almost zero error at a much higher value of noise than the averaging process does. And, and by the way, this is, this is so that the true value here is supposed to be yellow, corresponds to the value two. And so if you have a lot of noise, and this is a plot of all the, um, of all the uh, experiments, so as, as you do um, more and more uh, experiments, you get, um, with, it, with lower and lower noise, you get um, more accurate values from the, from the averaging. So these are, are just the, the actual samples. And then if you compare um, the uh, averaging a thousand samples to the iterative time reversal, then you find that if you just do one time reversal iterate, that's not very good, but as you do, you know, five, six, seven, you're getting pretty good values. Um, yeah, and, and certainly by the time you get up to, to uh, 10, you're doing very well. So this is another way of looking at the same data. So, so suppose we, um, at, at, each, at each noise amplitude, so each vertical line is a separate experiment with a different level of noise. And we just plotted how many of those uh, this is the, the vertical line is a, each one is a histogram of what did those experiments predict should be the maximum resonance. So, um, so at each, so for example, here at this vertical line, um, the, with uh, this amount of noise, the, uh, this many experiments, this fraction of the experiments. So here's the, the color scale shows the fraction of the experiments that predict that value is the resonance. So the, the, true, the correct value is two, right? And so th this experiment shows that at low levels of noise, even just two time reversal iterates, we're getting pretty good estimates for very low values of noise. And so then the question is, how high up can we go? How much noise can we add and still get reasonable performance? Well, we can go two, three, four iterates. We notice we're getting up to much, much higher levels of noise. And then, but then when you go to 20 time reversal iterates and then 100, there's not really much difference between these. How does that compare to averaging? Well, here, um, 
Th this was 100 time reversal iterates. This was 200 averages. And this is much worse. We, we have to have much less noise in order to be able to get the right answer. And here's a thousand averages. So it's getting better, but it's still not nearly as good as time reversal. But we've just seen that the problem is that this time reversal saturates, right? Because it's effectively the time reversal process is working because you're taking all the energy that you're transmitting and all transmitting it at the right frequency. And once you're doing that, the more times you do it, once you have all the energy going at the right frequency, there's nothing more you can do. Whereas with averaging, you're, you're putting in more and more energy all the time. Every time you take another measure, you're, you're adding more energy and that will eventually, eventually when you add more and more energy, you'll, that'll win out. Okay, so the, the conclusions are that time reversal is, uh, is kind of better if you need, uh, if, if you have very few measurements that, that in order to get, in order for the averaging process, which is much cheaper equipment, in order for the averaging process to do better, you'd have to, be able to average way more, way more, many times, <laughs> way, way, a lot more times. Um, but if you, if for some reason your time is limited or your energy is limited, the time reversal might actually be a better choice. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that we don't know how to do. Uh, you know, may, maybe the optimal way of doing it is to com combine averaging and time reversal so that maybe that would, uh, get around the saturation problem of the time reversal, but still uh, have the, the speed of, the, of, the, of time reversal. On the other hand, once you're using time reversal, you have more expensive equipment. So um, we also don't really have a theoretical analysis of the signal to noise. There is one paper, which I tried to add in on one of these pages. I, I, for some reason, the Zoom uh, bar is covering the bottom of the page, but there is one paper on the um, the iterative uh, power method with noise added that may be uh, may be useful here. And we still don't know how to get the poles. <laughs> you know, we we tried plotting these. Uh, this is the the good thing of the, the transfer function, the the scattering matrix, just the scalar plotted in the complex plane as a function of frequency, frequency is on the vertical axis. And it wanders around in a very interesting way. You know, these loops tend to indicate that we're, we're uh, passing through a pole. And then as you do more time reversal iterates, these loops wind around faster and faster. You know, it seems like there ought to be something we could do with that, but we don't know exactly what. <laughs> so, and then is there a way of exploiting uh, the spectral information? You know, you know suppose you measure different eigenvalues at different frequencies, you know, that you could get the first one and then you maybe take the maximum eigenvalue of the second, the, the highest, the, the frequency at which the second eigenvalue is highest. What information is that giving you about the target? Well, we're not really sure. <laughs> um, but one thing we do know is that in this process, you have to be very careful about what question you're asking. So that the question this whole talk has been about has been what waveform is, is best for detecting the presence of a target? You know, how do we get the most energy back? But that is clearly the wrong answer if you want to make an image of the target. And that's because a single frequency waveform is not best for forming an image. It's known that, that in order to form a good image, the, the resolution of your image depends on bandwidth and the answer to this detection problem is we're getting zero bandwidth, right? So, so that the fact that we're getting the wrong answer means we're not asking the right question. So if you want to answer a question about image formation, you have to include the image formation process in your question. So you can ask what waveform gives an image with the best resolution. Um, we've actually done some, oh yeah, so, uh, done some work on this, but this is a, another story that would be another talk. But let me just point out that, that this is a kind of a tricky question because suppose, you know, on the one hand we want, in, we, we know that in order to get more signal, we, would, we should have a narrow bandwidth. But on the other hand, to get better resolution, we want more bandwidth. But then you really have to include noise because like 
suppose you're transmitting energy through foliage, for example, and foliage is known to not transmit very much energy at, at uh, high frequencies. I should be pointing over here, but high frequencies, you get very little transmission and at low frequencies, you get more transmission. But suppose you're trying to transmit over this band, this frequency band, but you have a noise level that's making the high frequencies less useful for, so at what point do you need to include noise? So, so in order to figure out, to in, in order to answer a question about imaging, you really need to in, have a formulation of the problem that also includes noise. And one of the challenges here is the full radar imaging problem is nonlinear. And um, the, there's an easy way to think about this. And that is, if the problem were linear and you had two targets, then the signal from one target would just add to the signal from the other target if you add both of them. But if you have two targets in the scene at the same time, there's new physics that goes on. And that's this multiple scattering between the targets. And so in order to really do a good job with imaging, you really should include this uh, nonlinear aspect, but all the imaging algorithms use these linearized models. So there, so we have the fundamental problem here, you know, in order to, in order to include this resonance effect in the model, we need the nonlinearity, but we don't know how to do imaging in non for nonlinear problems. So there's kind of a we're kind of stuck. There's sort of a fundamental obstacle in the field here. Radar and sonar imaging methods. Some of them can handle noise, but none of them know how to answer how to deal with multiple scattering. Now, some mathematicians are have been working on this, right? So there are a bunch of approaches, but the problem is so that there are lots of good ideas. But all these approaches require measurements at a lot of spatial locations. And that's typically not what you have in radar and sonar. So, so far, there's nothing that we know how to do that is going to be able to do imaging from, say, a synthetic aperture radar system or a, a reasonable kind of sonar system that's going to be able to, um, going to, be able to handle the nonlinearity. OK, so I think I'll stop there. Um, and uh, take questions if maybe I should uh, maybe I should stop sharing and and uh, turn my camera back on. All right, let's smash those reaction buttons and thank Margaret.